Thank you very much for attending this very difficult time slot between um, lunch and the next talk, because I know um, everybody is still basically trying to process the food. This talk is about steal these ideas, and basically I thought about all the stuff that have happened in the industry since uh, a long time. And what I think we as blue teams, we as defenders, might still do wrong. There's this famous quote by a guy called Mullah Nasruddin. Sometimes people think the mistakes they keep making since 30 years are experience. Now what you need to know about Mullah Nasruddin is that this guy sits backwards on his ass. And we might disagree on a few things I'm going to talk about that's perfectly fine. And where I'm coming from is some of that position, because all the mistakes I'm pointing out, something we, our company, still does in some respects, um, other companies do, I just would like to change it for the better. And I also think that a lot of the stuff probably isn't going to be that new, but I'd like to present you with a few ways out, maybe, um, and how we can actually tackle a few of the things that I think we're doing wrong. Another short disclaimer, I'm going to use a few stories to illustrate my points, and all of these stories are true. I will have altered the names of the companies, or the people, or whatever, or not actually name them at all, but they are mostly true. I didn't actually make them up. And just a small request, because I... Oh, I have a watch here. I wanted to say I don't have a watch, I don't know when I'm finished, but I started wearing what? Sorry, um, cut that out from, uh, from the video, please. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever we are talking about things that could be done better, um, we can identify patterns, patterns within different things, the organization, humans, or technical patterns. I use technical patterns as the first thing because many of the main points are of a technical nature. If you think about where security is coming from or has come from the 90s where I started working in, in the industry to now, it was a very different kind of beast back then. So the first thing, and I'm going to talk in length about that, is logging, basically. So who of you, if you'd like to do me the favor and do a show of hands, Who of you is logging nearly everything on a technical level that happens in their network and their enterprise and their appliances and everything? We too. So, next question would be, who of you is looking at all of these logs? And that, I think, is one of the problems. Because from a technical point of view, from a forensic point of view, it's great if you have access to all the logs. It's wonderful. If you need to find out what went wrong, then you need to have a look at the logs. You should have all of them. But from a defender's point of view, I don't want to look at the logs when I'm doing a forensic investigation of the case. I want to have an alert when some script finds out that my logs look suspicious and I need to have a look at it now before it becomes an incident that I need to forensically investigate. So... I would like to make a strong case on uh, selective alerting on logs. Um, this is something that can get us out of a lot of problems. Probably all of you who are working for a larger company will have some kind of CM, be it Curator, be it Splunk, or any other vendor. I don't want to single anyone out. And all of them give you the opportunity to combine different kinds of events to say if this happens and that happens, then this is potentially bad. Now, what happens if you have security use cases that are not really very good? Then your analysts, again, get flooded with alerts, and very much of them um, will be crap. So you need to avoid false positives as much as you can. If you do a daily tuning off your logs, off your alerts and everything, I think that can be done. And you can get valuable statistics. And as a very, very good point as well, 
if you have a few people who are looking at the logs, tuning them, and bringing them into alerts, then you will have, this team will have a very good feeling of what's happening in your network and what is considered to be normal. Because if you speak to any vendor somewhere, they say, well, we do network anomaly detection and things like that. But in order to find out what's not normal, uh, you need to have some kind of, of identifier what actually is normal. And if you don't look at your logs on a regular basis, I think this, going, this is going to be really hard. Um, we've got a shitload of logs everywhere. This is just a small subset. And I intended to do something like 99 use cases in under 10 minutes uh, to baffle you um, and to show off my, my ignorance. But basically, I didn't do that. But if you think about use cases, security use cases, I'm not talking about monitoring. I want to make that point clear because monitoring is important. You need to do that. With monitoring, I mean you need to watch for um, a server CPU, memory, whether the hard disk is full, and so on and so forth. But that has nothing to do with security logging. Security logging, for example, if you think about your web service, you provide some kind of website to your clients coming from the Internet. That's fine. But, for example, you could alert whenever one of those web servers that are connected to the Internet um, starts initiating a connection, because that is irregular. Or if you have some kind of sub substandard ports and there's a connection going to them and it's allowed, you might want to know about that. So when, you're use when, when I'm thinking about security use cases, this is always the case that actually you try to find out stuff that should not happen. Um, where you are sure you did everything to prevent it, but basically checking on that and getting an alert is something that is worth looking at. Another example would be mail servers. Um, you probably have a few mail servers that are allowed to send mail out to the Internet. If you don't, um, I urge you to restrict the group of mail servers that can send mail um, in your firewalls and just check if really just that group is sending mail. Because if another server starts sending mail, check for spam. Check whether anything happened with that. And by combining different logs you, and, and constructing interesting use cases, you actually can get a lot of insight in what's happening. And you can put alarms and alerts together that will help you to, de uh, to defend yourself a lot better. So, another good thing, which is embarrassing, is that usually you get the speaker's view on there, and there are my notes, because I need notes, because I only have pictures, but I know what I'm talking about, hopefully. In this case, in this story time, um, there was a company that wanted to buy a new web application firewall. They were running on um, mod security at that point. And they wanted to invest into something that was not community-based and that was from a bigger vendor because of reasons, because they thought uh, that would be better to handle and easier to manage and so on and so forth. So they went to the manager in question who would sign off the six-figure bill and they made their case. And the manager said, well, how does it, how does it work now? They said, well, we have this web application firewall and whenever something suspicious is going on, then we log it. Manager said, we don't stop the traffic, we just log it. And they said, yeah, it was management decision because if you stop the traffic, there might be false positives and clients might not get connection. So we just log it. Manager said, okay, understood. Who's looking at the logs? And the guy said, well, no one, unless it's an incident. He said, you want to give me, uh, you want me to give you 300,000 euros? for something you don't look at at the moment, um, either I haven't understood or you're doing it wrong, but I can't give you the money if you're not using it. So basically that manager got logging, um, understood logging a way better than uh, the, that team did. And this is important because if you can talk to management and if you can make the case to them, you will get some more money. Hope, hopefully. So as you can see, that guy at the back of the truck is helping. He really is. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a little bit 
the picture I'd like to use to illustrate um, how I see logging if you in a security way if you don't use it to produce meaningful alerts. You've got everything in place, and most of you probably will pay a lot of money to companies like Splunk if you're not using any open source alternative. Um, so start using it, please. The next thing is devices in your network, security appliances. About a month ago, I've been to InfoSecurity at London, and I guess a few of you have been as well. And you always get the feeling when walking the floor that you could buy this appliance, this wonderful IPv6 AI-enabled dark blockchain crypto box, and you just plug it into your network, put in power, put in network, and it will save your network <laughs> magically, somehow. And a lot of those vendors seem to think that if they just say, trust me long enough, that you're going to trust them. Um, it doesn't really work with me. But on the other hand, people are buying them. And our company is buying them as well. And what it is or what it should be, it should be a tool within your whole tool chain of securing your enterprise's network. It should be something that helps you. It should be something that is at its place doing what you think it's doing. And it should look like a workshop like that, filled with tools. But basically, I guess if you have an honest, hard look at your security appliances, then sometimes it looks like that. And why is that? Sometimes security appliances get bought to tick a box for compliancy. This is bad, because very often those security appliances have some kind of function. Not all are completely useless. Um, I should phrase that more positively. Um, a lot of them are going to provide something, not all of the stuff that they um, promised you that they would deliver in the end, but they are providing some kind of service. If you just leave it unattended, unpatched in your network and don't look at the logs, then you won't have any fun with them. And so the next story time is, again, from personal experience with a vendor I won't disclose. Um, we did a proof of concept with their box, and this was one of the boxes where they said, it doesn't need anything. It needs this kind of traffic mirrored, and it doesn't need internet connection at all. We won't speak out to the internet. Uh, it would be good if it had some kind of internet access for updates, and it needs power, and so on and so forth. So because the technician was a guy I knew and trusted, we tried the thing. I'm usually not really falling for its magic, trust me. But um, and they said, well, uh, it's going to, you plug it in, and boom, magic happens. So would you like to take a guess what kind of magic was happening when we plugged it in? Well, the first thing is, of course, it connected to home base to get updates. But that was kind of expected. The next thing was that we didn't really get a lot of alerts from that box. We monitored it and we had a few things, mostly false positives. It was something to detect anomalies in our network and alert us if something was going wrong. And Basically, I'm, I'm a suspicious guy. If a new box doesn't tell me anything is wrong within our network, I get suspicious. It's, I know our network is good and everything, but basically, I never trust anyone who tells me that everything is peachy and vanilla. So we had a look ourselves. I tried to create a few alarms. Didn't work. And I then had a phone call with a technician. And during the phone call, I found out that he read a few things to me where I, think, where I thought, where did you get that information? And he said, well, our dashboard looks different. I said, just wait a minute. You have a dashboard. I have a dashboard. And I, as the customer paying for that box, see less than you? I said, yeah, that's the moment, at the moment, that's the way it works. And um, I just plucked it off. I plucked it out and, and sent it back to him because we didn't buy it yet and it was a proof of concept. But this is the kind of shit you, you have to deal with and you have to look for that. And afterwards they also told us that, yeah, it didn't produce meaningful results because we didn't plug it in into our, our active directory and we didn't 
provide this and that data, but the sales team denied beforehand that the box would use that data. So be very, very suspicious about that, please. And if you have boxes like that in your network, I'd like you to think about um, powering them off. If you don't use them, they are basically, from a technical point of view, a security risk, because you've got another gate into your network. It might be the vendor. The vendor might be benevolent. They might not be. Whoever knows. And if it's just to tick a box on a list, then I'd urge you to try to get into a discussion with the guys who need that checkbox ticked. I know that this is, um, that is a lot to ask, but I think we as defenders also need to get better in communicating with all the people we are defending. Very often they don't understand what we are doing, and we don't actually try to understand what they are doing or why they need us. If you don't want to power it off, if you can't power it off, start using it, start making use of the logs. Again, go into logging, try to produce meaningful alerts for what it's worth. Because basically, for me, at the end, if it does, if you need to run it and you can't power it off and it provides 15% security instead of 100% security, it's still 15% more than zero. But if you can power it off, just do it. And another thing that comes from the whole mindset that uh, we developed, we, sysadmins, I'm, I'm talking about us old farts, uh, 20, 30 years ago, we thought that security meant network security, which is, you know, you secure your network, you've got a firewall, you know where your parameter is, and you just build walls around that, which works fine for castles, usually. But if you think, and it, it worked in 2000, maybe, but if you think of nowadays workplaces, you will have stuff like site-to-site -site VPNs, people working from home, people bringing their mobile devices into your network, and so on and so forth. So, again, I'd like to ask you a question. Who of you feels confident in defining all the entry points into their company's networks? I don't. I know we've got way over 10, 15, or 20 where it's a large network, uh, but still, it really gets hard to defend on just that level. And even if you're really confident that you know everything about your network and your parameter, then there are guys like Tinker. <laughs> it's one of my favorite tweets, because it's like, yeah, I've got a domain controller, what, what am, am I going to do with it? But I think very often, the physical level of things is not being taken into account. I once worked for a company, and they had their data centers distributed, as you do, because, you know, always thinking about the worst case, if one goes down, then you need to use the other one. And the second data center was in the cellar of a building that did leather working. It was really loud, and it was really hidden, and nobody went there except people like me who needed to work on service there or firewalls there. And one day I went there, and the door was open, and there was a stone just holding the door open. This was an alerted door and with just a few keys. So I was really curious, and I went inside, and there was nobody in. So I started to dial um, the number of my boss to tell him that this is highly irregular. And a few people came back, obviously from lunch, into the room, and they were working on cables. They were electricians um, who were paid to do work, but nobody gave them the key. And the person who should be there um, supervising them, he buggered off for lunch too, but not with them. So their only option in order to keep working was to put a stone in the door and hold it open. And this is something, you know, all the backups of all the data we had this is 20 years ago, was in that second, second um, data center. Any attacker with malicious intent would have a field day if they found it out. Yeah, basically, I already had the story time. And the thing is, to me, that security must include people. Not just people, other things as well, but especially people. If you consider this, this looks like a perfect barrier, right? And Every human who approaches that would see it's a barrier. 
Do you agree? Yes. So consider this. <laughs> <laughs> No fucks given. <laughs> and this is, this is, you know, people will be people. People will be like that. And no matter how much we want them to, to respect the barrier, they won't. And another thing is the whole dogma of never touch a running system. If you talk to older security guys or older sysadmins and people in tech, um, they might tell you that never touch a running system was kind of a mantra, again, 20, 10 years ago, but it's not really valid for nowadays. But still, uh, people are stuck in the mindset that if you have a machine and it does its job and it does its job well, then you shouldn't touch it. You shouldn't touch it at all because if you touch it and it breaks, you have to repair it which sucks. So never touch a running system became one of the strongest things that people, um, the strongest points people try to make when you were working on hardware or software. You don't just patch things because you might break it. If it runs, let it run. And nowadays it's more or less constantly update everything. I mean, there's fridges connected to the internet. There's smart diapers that tell the parents if the baby made a whatever in the diaper. And sex toys are connected to the internet. Everything is connected to the internet. And as soon as it's connected to the internet, it tries to update, if there are updates. I mean, this IoT is a whole different kind of beast. And there's enough stuff that doesn't get updated at all. But if there are updates, stuff is constantly updating. Now, if you consider those two, never touch a running system and constantly update everything. You can't have both. You just can't have both. And the problem is that, especially with medical devices, it's not easy to update. and It's not easy to patch at all. But medical devices is, for me, one of the most interesting use cases because you've got machines that are certified to operate on humans. And they are certified for very, very specific hardware revision and software level. And as soon as you change the tiniest bit, it's not certified to operate on humans anymore. And guess what? If the doctor, whoever, whoever is operating them, makes a mistake, then the insurance <coughs> won't cover it. So these things don't get updated. As we have seen with WannaCry and other things, um, this is going to be a massive problem. But you can't update them. Not in the way that you can update your, your mobile phone or apps or anything. So what can you do? Again, one shouldn't just stand there and think, I can't do anything anyway, so I just let, uh, let it run its course. Oh yeah, um, sorry about that thing uh, that everything is connected to the internet. I found the tweet. I have no idea whether this is just a joke or made up or not, but... There is a Samsung LCD fridge with Twitter and apps, and so it's probably a joke, but it's a good one. Everything is connected to the internet, and even if you don't know it. Yeah, and as I've said, sometimes all of you will know that in our industry, there's no silver bullet for the stuff we're facing. So even if I say, you know, you need to constantly update everything or patch everything, there might be solutions, but they could be ugly. No picture in me, though. It's just one of the pictures that came up when I googled ugly. Um, the solutions that we have is... The one thing is, you should update everything that you can. The other thing is, if you can't update it, then try things like virtual patching. This is meaning if you have a web application firewall, and a vulnerable medical device, let's say, behind that, and you know it's, uh, there's, there's a vulnerability and you want to protect against that, um, protect against it on the web application firewall level. This is ugly, and I, that's why I called it ugly solutions, so please don't heckle me and say, uh, that's ugly, because I know. On the other hand, if that is the only way to protect that machine, then it's better than nothing. It will fail if the web application firewall goes down, because usually then uh, traffic just passes through. But on the other hand, it will help you the, as long as it's running. 
And you could do air gap networks for that stuff. I know that has issues as well because everything has issues. But try to find out how you can minimize the risk for the stuff that is at risk within your company. And of course, you could also start with not plugging everything into the internet and making everything online. I mean, why does a diaper need to be online? I have no idea. But, well, as a concerned parent, you can see the level of shit. Which is great. Um, but, again... There are some organizational patterns as well. These were the technical patterns. And within organizations, we have to deal with other people, which is unfortunate, but that's part of our job. And it gets more in the future. I, I'm saying this is unfortunate. This is a joke because actually I think we really need to uh, connect more to the people we are protecting. We need to talk to them more. And very often, sometimes, not very often, but sometimes when you have kind of a tech ignorance level, they are of the opinion that secure should mean it's 100% secure. And this is a major communication thing between techies and non-techies. Because basically, I don't know about you, but as somebody coming from a technical background, if somebody tells me it needs to be 100% secure, um, nothing is. Absolutely nothing is. Everything can fail. It might be 99 point whatever percent, but it's not 100%. And I never can guarantee 100%. For somebody coming from marketing or somebody not coming from a technical background, that is good enough. That's kind of what they mean by 100%. But we need to have that kind of discussion. And there's one thing. Our industry has split opinions, to say the least, and that is antivirus. I've talked to people who said, uh, very often younger people, not really working yet, but very tech-savvy, who told me, you know, um, antivirus is so broken and can be abused and everything, so you're better off if you don't run anti an antivirus system. I came up with those two planes, which might be a shitty comparison, but you're going to have to listen to it anyway. <laughs> so consider those two planes. The one plane doesn't have parachutes on it. Parachutes, you know, those... Am I saying it right? Yeah. Um, both planes are probably going to have problems mid-air. First plane doesn't have any parachutes. Second one has parachutes. They only open in about 70-80% of all cases. And someone has found a fancy way to make them burst into flames midair if they are on the same plane. Which plane are you going to board? And I'm plane B because it has friggin' parachutes. Because if the plane is going to have problems, and um, I take the risk that the guy who figured a way... Um, figured out a way how to set them aflame um, mid-air, I'll take that risk. Um, I'm rarely boasting about my own company. It's not my own company, the company I work for, sorry. Um, should be a little bit more humble than that. Uh, we have an email system that tries to catch viruses and malware like everybody else. Um, we got certified, this is German, so it could say I'd like to have a sausage roll for those of you uh, who don't speak German. But if you run it through Google Translate, it says that our corporate email security is certified um, by AV test, which you might or might not know, it's a German company as well. And it catches a lot of stuff. So you can use antivirus in a way that is helpful. The way we're using it, if you're interested, I can talk about it. We, we have several scanners and we keep emails for 24 hours and scan them Within those 24 hours, we deliver them already, but within 24 hours, they get rescanned and rescanned whenever there's new patterns. And if we find that it had a virus, we try to get it from the post box, get it back. If it has already been opened, um, we know which PC probably is affected, and so on and so forth. <coughs> so you can use it in a meaningful way. If you're just running your own computer at home or your own <coughs> server and you know what you're doing, you might not need antivirus. 
totally with you on that. Sorry, but... I'm having trouble hearing you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to talk louder then. <laughs> But yes, uh, you can uh, if you if you're just doing it for yourself. I'm pretty sure you don't need a wireless scanner um, if you know what you're doing. But within a corporate environment, there's a lot of people who are not as tech savvy and who need to be protected. And I think that's the job of the blue team as well. And this might sound like a very harsh truth, and it is. Whenever there's attacks going on that are not specifically targeted at your company or your network, but that just target everybody they can get, <coughs> like think about WannaCry, um, then you don't really have to outrun the dragon. You have to outrun the slowest hobbit. So as soon as your security level is more mature than that of your peers, you're better protected. And anything that you can do to, to raise that level... I'm not saying... Um, Leave the slow ones behind because they are going to be eaten anyway. But I think every little bit you can do for your company really helps. What I also find is that very often we are very much focused on protection. And we're waiting for stuff to happen. And when stuff happens, then we try to figure out what to do next. And this is for me a little bit late. I've been in enough security incidents in companies that didn't have any kind of plan on what to fucking do when there's a security incident. Excuse my language. And I hate that because if you talk to the C-level and managers beforehand and say, we need to have a plan, we need to be able to act in the moment when something happens, we need to know whom to inform, we need to know who can decide what, even if it's Saturday uh, 2 a.m. And most of the companies say, well, we'll deal with it when we get to that point, but we're protected anyway. Are you saying we're under threat? No, not immediately, not necessarily. But if you've ever been in the situation in a war room where shit was um, hitting the fan, then very often this was the thing that you wanted to have. You wanted to have a plan because this gives security, because if you are nervous or anxious about what to do next, and you have something laid out when you were of a clear mind, then this helps immensely. So I'd like to urge you to think about what could happen. You don't need to have a look at the most outrageous things like there's going to a bomb is going off and there's zombie invasion. This is useless. This is uh, tabletop exercises that might be fun, but in the end, they are useless. But think about stuff like what happens if a part of your network has a ransomware encryptor running, uh, what you're going to do, and who's going to decide what to do, or who's going to authorize what you are about to do, like taking a web service off offline and things like that. Um, in a broader view, probably you should also have a plan about how to talk to the media, how to talk to your GDPR officer, um, um, whom to talk to within your organization. Um, everybody should agree on that. It, if you make the plan for yourself, that's nice, that's better than nothing, but try to get it approved across the whole company so if something happens, you can do something about it. Yeah, the idea I'd like you to steal from that is really please be prepared for emergencies and have a written plan and keep it up to date and also know where it is because there's nothing worse than knowing in the back of your head that you did write something down somewhere but you don't remember the folder or the share where it was or was it in a blog? Did I just write it as an email? And um, when an incident happens and you start searching for the plan, that's also not very good. One thing where I'm really happy about is when I started a few years ago talking about people. Well, I listened to Jessica Barker talking about that people are not the weakest link. And she set me on the course where, where I thought, yeah, this is a topic I'd like to talk about. Um, because I also feel that very often we in the industry uh, are doing a shitty job of protecting the people. And very often we are just pointing at them and saying they are the weakest link. They are stupid. This is something I could talk about uh, 
I could go on for hours, and I'm going to spare you that. But I put a few interesting um, talks by other people who know way more than me uh, in the slide, and I'm going to publish the slides today or tomorrow. And so I'm, I'm only going to go quickly through that. And I was also already talking about protection, about the network, about the parameter. And if you think about protection, again, coming from, from the years before, we really do a lot of protection. Your security basically rests on those three columns of detection, protection, and reaction. But it's like with a paid DLC. Um, somebody does a shitty Photoshop, and then it looks like that. <laughs> and a lot of your security actually just really rests on protection. If I was to ask you whether you have a firewall, you'd probably raise your hand. Um, IDS, I, IPS, maybe as well. And a lot of those things, IDS, IPS, goes more in, in the direction of detection, but a lot of the stuff is just to protect the network. Because when we think about detection, again, we can write hundreds and thousands of logs, but without filtering them and coming back to the meaningful alerts, nobody's going to look at them and you burn every security analyst who, who tries to scroll through them. I tried, when I started with a new company, um, with a company I'm working for at the moment, one of the first things I did was try to look at the firewall logs and see what could be tuned because nothing showing up in the firewall logs is good. I don't really care about anything that comes from the internet and gets dropped by the firewall logs. I'm not looking at those. But our company has, I think, about 70 clusters, firewall clusters, and not all, all of them are connected to the internet. So basically, whenever something is in the logs, I thought, naively, I should have a look at it, because either it's a misconfigured server, as in 90, 95% of all cases, or it's something I need to have a look at. So... Would anyone want to take a guess how many locks the firewalls combined locked in a day? 20 million. <laughs> I saw the number and I thought, you know what, fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to, I tried to, um, well, I, I went through the locks. I, I tried to see the most chatty things that went on and tried to get people to tune the service and make it better. But it was an, an uphill battle because all day long there's new services coming up and so on and so forth. And so nobody really is looking at that. And by reaction, I don't mean hack back. I don't really need to say that to you, but I'm, I'm saying that for the sake of the video. If somebody from our government or others are watching the video, I don't think so, but still hack. Um, Hack back is not an option, but reacting to something in an automated way um, could be a thing. For example, if you think of somebody connecting their laptop to the network, and uh, you've got maybe network access control, the, network, uh, the laptop is scanned, they find out it's got some kind of software on it that you don't know, and you just put it in a network segment where it can get updated or inspected. This is an automated reaction and we're not doing a lot of, of, of that as well. And the last thing is, of course, uh, there are also patterns of a human nature. <clears throat> so, I need to think about how I put that, because I don't want you to get too paranoid. I still want you to be friendly and love your teammates and have an open heart for everyone. But on the other hand, sometimes you've got people within the team who might not have your best interests at heart. I think personally that it will be very, very rare that they are intentionally attacking your company, but very often they will, will be unintentional, um, will be somebody like, um, how do you put it, useful idiots is the term that was coined by governments and spy agencies. Not coined by me, but it's just people who will do stuff for you without realizing what they are doing. And I googled, because I wanted to have figures for insider threats, I googled the question, um, where do cyber attacks originate? And Google said China. 
<laughs> so, <laughs> good news is the attribution problem is solved. You know, it's China. Uh, I just put that in because I had a laugh. Uh, but then I found that, which said that breaches in 25% 20, uh, of breaches of data breaches are coming from unintentional insider threats. And again, years ago, the number of attacks that a company faces was much higher. It was something like 70% of attacks are coming from within the network. But attacks were also uh, data leakage, for example, um, people copying stuff, leaving folders unencrypted. I like that number because it's still high enough and it doesn't scare the shit out of uh, the sea level if you, if you show it to them, but it's still high enough to um, make them act. And again, you should be kind and friendly because <laughs> nobody is, you, you shouldn't be too paranoid about your co-workers and other people in this room, your friends, whatever. But there's actually no reason why you shouldn't, for example, lock your screen when you leave the room. Because they might leave the room, and it might be unattended. And it's not... I know as, as cultural people or, or social animals that we are, we like to show our trust by maybe not locking the screen, saying, well, you know, I trust you, that's fine. But still, if you just lock your screen and do other small things, other people won't think any any lower of you, um, and you will protect yourself a lot better, and probably your enterprise as well. And this morning, in your talk, I'm going to quote you now, um, <laughs> you said something along the lines, <laughs> so much for hacking, um, <laughs> you said something along the lines, if your security team consists of just one person, then you're screwed. Right? Yeah, that was a hack effect. Yeah. yeah. Um, very often, a lot of the security teams, I think probably every team, but we're talking security teams right now, will have one or two people who are very enthusiastic about what they're doing, and the rest probably just doing their job. And the people who are really enthusiastic about it, very often hack in their spare time, are um, <coughs> active in communities, and so on and so forth. And they are very often regarded as the rock stars. So when they're on holiday and something minor happens, very often this doesn't get solved until the person comes back and solves it. Because people are A, lazy, and B, there's another trait of rock stars. Very often if you solve a problem and you don't solve it the way they would have solved it, you're going to hear, the, hear that for weeks or months or longer. And so... People just keep their hands off the stuff and say, well, when he's back, he can fix it, or she. I still think we should uh, spread the knowledge, and I still think that rock stars in the industry are, except the beer farmers probably, <laughs> um, rock stars in the industry are not a good thing, because very often this is not about knowledge, but about ego, and in the end, you should try to distribute the knowledge and distribute responsibility. Because very often if you give people responsibility for something, they care about it more than if it's somebody else's problem. And again, if you gently can nudge people out of their comfort zone, give them tasks that they usually would say, um, I can't do that, but he can, um, they're going to grow. So more or less, you help them as well. And then... One of the, I, I have no idea, I only worked one year in Scotland, so I can't really comment on the state of the industry in the UK. But in Germany, in larger companies, it's so important to pass the blame and cover your ass, you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> and I kind of hate that, because it doesn't really solve anything. So, there was this incident where major services stopped working at the company I was working for back then. And we were frantically trying to figure out what happened and how to actually get everything up and running again. And my then boss came into the office and said, um, who requested the change? And sometimes when I'm in a situation like that and frantically typing away the keyboard, I can be short of words and maybe even not so polite and said, who cares? 
And so I got pulled away from my keyboard, and she was very adamant in telling me that this is no tone to speak to her, and she needs to know who requested the change. And part of me was furious because I would love to solve the problem now and not talk to you, lady, but of course we went to the locks, we found out who requested the change, and she gave a sigh of relief. Ah, it was not, not us then. Said, Why does that matter? She said, well, I'm going to meet with my boss, thank you very much, and if I can say it wasn't us, then I'm covered. Well, I'm not working there anymore, so um <laughs> should give you an idea why. But this is really something where I think we need to stay neutral. <coughs> it really, really doesn't matter who left the candle burning as long as the house is burning. Um, once everything's been dealt with, it's really a good idea to find out the reasons for the incident, because if you don't find out the reasons, it might happen again. And then you can improve things. But just to say, yeah, it was then again, um, doesn't help anybody. And so the plea for that is just try not to pass the blame. Try to see how you can actually improve your processes so that this can't be happen, uh, can't happen anymore, despite Dan or whoever it was um, that did that. Because otherwise, by passing the blame, we're not really solving anything, are we? And to finish it off, I'm slightly over time, but we have still a few minutes until the next talk, right? Uh, I thought I have 45 minutes. But the usual suspects, we don't have the money. It would be cynical to say that if you don't get the money in today's climate, you're doing it wrong, um, and it's not helping. So, okay, if you don't have the money to do everything you want or to buy from vendors or to buy hardware, try to do it yourself. You can exchange the money that you need with time that you have. If you have neither time nor money, I'm getting to that, but sometimes you can find something open source, uh, an open source product that is going to do what you want, but you have to do it yourself and you have to configure it, you have to run it, you have to monitor it. It's a little bit more work than just buying an appliance and you remember what I told you about, about appliances anyway. We don't have the people, it's the next thing, and I'm not just talking about not getting the money to get new people on board, but again, I think the UK faces the same problem as Germany. We have way more companies looking for people than people looking for jobs in the cyber industry. I also think this is the problem, uh, one, one aspect of the problem is because the recruiters have a very specific mindset, like this need to, needs to be a CISSP with at least 10 years in this and that and that. And shouldn't be older than 20, should he? <laughs> <laughs> I had a nice email somewhere, but I didn't find it anymore, from the guy who was very heavily involved with Angular. And he responded to a job offer saying that they needed somebody with 10 years of Angular experience, and he said, you know, it's only been around for six years, <laughs> and they told him to shut up. Um, and we do have the people, we just have to look a little bit differently at what we want. I mean, there's the talk by Ian, um, which was in its essence also saying, if you don't change our mindset about whom we want in the industry, we only get the same people and that will change nothing, if I um, summarize that correct. Yes, absolutely. And the last thing is, you might say, this is never going to work for my company. I've got two things about that. Not everything has to. If you can improve your company or your security just a little bit by stealing a few of these ideas, which I hope you will do, that is very good. And if you have the feeling that you can't change anything at your company, you don't have the time, you don't have the money, and you will never improve anything there, and it's frustrating, then I urge you to watch your mental health and get a job at a different company. Because at the end of the day, if you can't change anything by what you're doing and you're getting just frustrated, then really seriously think about maybe there's another, uh, another company you'd like to work for. So, yeah. Basically, if you see a lamp and rub it and see that symbol, um, it doesn't really mean you get granted free wishes. So if you're running low, 
with your mental health or whatever you have, uh, whatever it is you feel for your company, then just think about either getting into a different state of mind, not taking everything too seriously, or changing the company. So this being SteelCon, I don't have any key takeaways for you, but I've got takeaway keys. So <laughs> if you'd like some, help yourself. Thanks for listening. Thank you. <coughs> Are there any questions? So one question I have, um, or kind of a comment. So when you talk about people um, and insider threats and that, Often, one of the things is always, oh, security is not my responsibility. What do you say to that? We're trying to tackle that by actually, at our company, we're, we're trying it from a different angle. We're doing a lot of security awareness workshops and stuff for the people at home. Because if they have some kind of better security at home, they will translate that to a better security in the company. Because I know that that kind of uh, mindset where people say, you know, when I'm working at the company, I expect other people to do the security because I'm not within the security team. We're trying to get the point across that everybody's doing security, but not in a way that it's their sole responsibility, just in a way that, um, you know, like locking your screens and things like that. We're trying to get to them. There will be some boneheads who will always say, it's not my problem. But with not locking their screens, those boneheads very often find out that they somehow invited the whole team to um, bagels or donuts or beer or whatever, and then they will lock the screens. So, so everybody's good. Uh, yeah. Any more questions? Thank you. Please take a few keys and have a nice afternoon. Thanks.